A new investigation zeroes in on this year's judicial races, which have drawn unprecedented attention from dark money donors that seek more influence for less money than bankrolling legislative campaigns. The story is headlined as your judge for sale. Thanks to Carl Rove and Citizens United, judicial elections have been overtaken by secretive interest groups, nasty ads, and the constant hustle for campaign cash. Well, what we've seen is that judicial elections have become um, another playground for the same kind of uh, business interests and huge spenders. Hi, I'm Larry DeMarco, host of The Law Center. I produced a library of self-help videos to help parents navigate through divorce court. To watch these videos, please click one of the links in the description portion of this video to any of the family court self-representation playlists. I'm also a big proponent of family court reform because of my own personal experiences in government and family court. I've seen firsthand the abuses that can and do occur because of the influence of money in politics. Judges are either appointed by powerful politicians or are politicians themselves who become elected through a highly partisan political system. 200 years ago, it was our founding father, Thomas Jefferson, who criticized the judicial branch of government in a letter, quote, you seem to consider judges the ultimate arbiters of all constitutional questions. A very dangerous doctrine indeed, and one which would place us under the despotism of an oligarchy. Our judges and their power are more dangerous as they're in office for life and not responsible like other are to elective control. Its members would become despots. In addition to having judges serve in judicial office practically for life, their position has also become increasingly political. This sets up judges as pawns of a political system who must answer to their campaign donors, committee people to whom they must seek an endorsement, bar association lawyers who can recommend them as highly qualified, and political bosses who can appoint them as judicial candidates or political appointees. These powerful groups often have contrary interests to the rule of law or the public who the judges swear to protect. The newscast, Democracy Now!, featured an investigative report entitled, Is Your Judge for Sale?, a trend which has accelerated over the past decade. A new investigation zeroes in on this year's judicial races, which have drawn unprecedented attention from dark money donors that seek more influence for less money than bankrolling legislative campaigns. The story is headlined as your judge for sale. Thanks to Carl Rove and Citizens United, judicial elections have been overtaken by secretive interest groups, nasty ads, and the constant hustle for campaign cash. We're joined by its author, Andy Kroll, senior reporter for Mother Jones magazine. Welcome back to Democracy Now! Andy, you only have a few minutes to lay out what you found. Well, what we've seen is that judicial elections have become um, another playground for the same kind of uh, business interests and huge spenders and anonymous donors that we're seeing in presidential races and congressional races up and down the ticket. And our judicial elections used to be a more sleepy corner of American politics. And obviously, the dynamic is different if we're electing the arbiters of the law. But times have changed, and Citizens United has really begun to change the landscape in this, uh, in this place. A nonprofit, Pennsylvania for Modern Courts, discussed the particularly harmful effect that money has on the judicial profession. In the following clip, the speakers focus on appellate judges, but these principles still apply at the local county level. Judges are different from other public officials. Officials, like governors and legislators, are elected to represent their constituents and follow through on campaign promises. But judges are sworn to decide cases based strictly on the facts and the law. Selecting judges the same way we select our politicians is causing big problems. It costs over $2 million to run for the Pennsylvania Supreme Court. Because of that vast amount of money, the perception to the public is that the judge will be biased in favor of those interest groups and those individuals who have donated heavily to their campaign. When people think about courts, and the image of a judge in the robes or the image of Lady Justice blindfolded, they want to feel that they can come to courts and no matter who they are, no matter where they come from in the state, no matter their race or their gender or their economic status, that they will get a fair shake. Pennsylvanians have many reasons for their frustration with the courts and the desire for change. The problem heard most often about Pennsylvania's courts 
76% of Pennsylvanians believe that judges are influenced by campaign contributions. A good friend of mine who came to, came to me one day and said, I just had a weird thing happen. I was in court and um, the judge came in and I turned to my client and I said to him, uh, I don't like this, I don't like the feel of this because the lawyer on the other side was the head of this judge's campaign committee and that's going to be a bit of a disadvantage for us. And he said, my client thought about it for a minute and said, why weren't you on the committee? I am very concerned about what it's doing to this country to have partisan election of judges and big money changing hands. A movie, Divorce Corp, discussed the toxic effect that money has on judges in the domestic relations setting and the near unlimited power the judges have to collect debt. The attorneys representing my ex-husband were also large campaign contributors to the judge in our case. If you pull the records, you'll find oftentimes that the attorneys who make the largest contributions to the judges tend to win most of their cases. And the judge said, this thing about contributions is as uncomfortable for a judge as any topic you can get on. That's because you folks that are non-lawyers don't contribute to judicial campaigns. And the only way that a judge can run for re-election is to raise money for all those things that cost to get your name before the public. And you know who has the most interest in seeing that done? The lawyers. And if we read on, he says the lawyers only contribute to good judges. So what does it mean to be a good judge in the eyes of a lawyer? Perhaps it means seeing things their way. Some lawyers even boast that they can control the outcome of a case. They have it now where three to four hundred thousand dollars will guarantee the outcome. Amazingly, these same judges are also the ones who approve the bills of all the court professionals who work on your case. We talk about who are the most ferocious um, or feared collectors, and often you hear things like the IRS, right? Well, on that list, near the top of the list of the most fearsome would be the courts. And the reason is they have a lot of extra legal tools. In Delaware County, there was a perfect example of the power that the courts can exert on a litigant to collect a debt generated in divorce court. The litigant was imprisoned for 14 years for refusing to pay his debt, similar to a prison term for murder. As you can see, there's no dispute that a judge is one of the most powerful debt collectors in society. So lawyers, businesses, and others use every method in their arsenal to influence them. And campaign contributions are just one of many incentives that are used to influence judges. They have a family law section of the Los Angeles County Bar that's very active, that puts on programs. Some judges will sit on that executive committee from time to time. Judges will be in all the programs that they present. Um, you work together with them on panels, on presentations. Uh, so there's a lot of contact and communication, and you see these same lawyers all the time. The law firms have created conferences, all expense paid trips, and even awards that they give to the judges. And these activities are often sponsored by the same lawyers who present cases to these judges. The promise of employment for a judge upon his retirement can be the strongest influence. When a judge goes into retirement, they not only get a generous pension, but they also have the option to continue practicing privately as a judge or as a lawyer. And the law firm's pay is exponentially higher than what they were paid by the government. And unlike other public officials, judges do not have a waiting period between public and private practice. A judge can retire one day, practice as an attorney the next day, and then go back to being a pro tem judge a day later. Amazingly, your opposing attorney could literally have been serving as a judge the day before, having had lunch with the same judge you're sitting in front of today. With all this happening behind the scenes, it begs the question, is anyone actually getting a fair trial? As I always tell my grandchildren, follow the money, and you'll figure out why people are hurt and who is helped. Susan Settenbrino is a New York lawyer who fights corruption, and she wrote a book and lectures about judicial reform. In all other races for public office, contributors would say that they give to campaigns to ensure that candidates are elected who will represent their interests and give them access to the public official when issues arise. Checks and balances. This is the most important aspect we can have 
three separate functioning independent branches of government to act as checks and balances on one another. But in a politicized court system, these three branches are no longer independent. They are beholden to the political machine, the machine where attorneys and we are special interest groups and we are businesses that they are funding this machine to ensure their candidates are in office. The governors, the attorney generals, the DAs, the assemblymen, the judges, they're all part of the same machine. So do you think there's any oversight or accountability in that machine? When a political party controls all three branches of government, all critical checks and balances to limit government overreach are eliminated. The Bar Association admitted that the attorney must become known to the people who appoint judicial panels, that most screening panels are active members of the bar or community groups. And this is crucial, that judicial elections are primarily determined de facto at the nomination stage. And the election, well, that's just a formality. Please note the monumental implications of what Seton Brino is saying in this video clip. When one political party is dominant in a county, future judges of the county are selected at the committee person nominating stage. The actual election is merely a formality. In another video, I propose a way that we can increase the power of our voices by over 1,000 times by becoming a committee person in our own local political party. Due to the highly partisan nature of elections and the power of political parties, judicial elections are most often decided at the committee person stage, where there's one committee person for every thousand or so voters. Click the link in the right hand corner of your screen or in the description portion of this video to watch the video about the power of the committee person. The influence of money on judicial conduct is particularly horrifying when you consider a judge's near absolute discretion in divorce court. When you go to divorce court, you'll find that judges can do whatever they want. There is no law in family court. There's only, there's only what the judge wants to do. All judges have the same middle name, God. A friend of mine introduced me to a TED Talk, The Psychology of Evil, given by a famous psychologist, Dr. Phil Zimbardo. The TED Talk discussed studies which show how such godlike authority leads to corrupt behavior and abuse of power. His entire premise is that power is abused not by people who are inherently evil, but to buy a, by faulty systems. He begins with the premise that people aren't necessarily good or bad, but a combination of both. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. People are influenced by the Lucifer effect, which Zimbardo defines as power that tempts ordinary, regular people to engage in bad behavior. The human mind has the ability to choose to behave badly or behave well, to commit atrocities or become heroes. He illustrates this Lucifer effect with three examples. The first example he gave was American soldiers who abused Iraqi prisoners in Abu Ghraib. A second example was an electric shock experiment designed to test whether current circumstances existed for a second holocaust. The third example he gave was from the Stanford prison study, Zimbardo's own experiment. For the first example, Zimbardo was retained as an expert witness to defend one of the soldiers at that Iraqi prison. Zimbardo deduced that the human rights abuses happened because the government gave those prison guards absolute power to break the will of prisoners for interrogation. His hypothesis is, American soldiers are usually good. They're not a bunch of bad apples. It was the barrel that was bad, meaning the system that gave the soldiers absolute power with no oversight or accountability. The United States court system is another situation that gives judges absolute power without any oversight, accountability, or transparency, and therefore facilitates judicial abuse of power or evil behavior. So let's review a second example. Stanley Milgram, another famous psychologist, tested whether the Holocaust could happen again. He showed that people could easily be coerced into behaving badly. He ran an experiment where he would give people the power to shock innocent strangers with intense, painful electricity. So, as you can imagine, as the uh, electricity intensified, the student began screaming and pleading for mercy and begging for the teacher to stop in horrible agony. 
The scientist, the one conducting the study, convinces the teacher that the scientist himself will bear all responsibility if anything goes wrong. The vast majority, from between two thirds and 90% of normal people would torture a stranger and give that extreme shock. Milgram quantified evil as the willingness of people to blindly obey authority and forsake their own morals. His conclusion, you can tempt the vast majority of normal regular people into committing evil acts. Zimbardo clarifies that most of the time with human behavior, we're acting within institutions, not just as individuals, illustrated by the third example in his TED Talk. Zimbardo conducted the Stanford Prison Study that illustrated the power of institutions to influence individual behavior. In that experiment, he picked 24 of the healthiest and strongest out of 75 volunteers. He randomly assigned them prisoners and guards. The idea was to put the best in a bad situation. The experiment empowered the guards and dehumanized the prisoners. He gave the guards the symbol of authority and anonymity, dark glasses, uniforms, and billy clubs. And he stripped the prisoners, removed their names, and gave them a number. In five days, the Stanford prison guards began to abuse the prisoners just like the uh, soldiers abused the uh, prisoners in Abu Ghraib. Five prisoners had breakdowns within 36 hours. The abuse was so bad that the study ended after six days because it was out of control. Zambardo learned that changing one's appearance makes a difference for influencing behavior. In some cultures, armies paint themselves. In others, soldiers wear masks. Just like army soldiers can be anonymous in uniform, judges put on a black robe. And in some countries, they wear wigs. A system in our society that has the widest reach, most influence, and almost no transparency or accountability is the legal court system where human rights violations occur with the pounding of a gavel. To review, judges are the single most powerful politicians and they either must be appointed by another powerful politician or have massive amounts of wealth and or power to win outrageously expensive elections. They sit in family court without juries, with absolute power and almost no accountability or transparency for their decisions. Experience in scientific studies have repeatedly demonstrated that when powerful people are absolved of responsibility because they're in a corrupt system and you further remove transparency and accountability, it's a recipe for abuse of the weak and vulnerable. We saw this in Iraq in the Abu Ghraib prison, Stanley Milgram showed us in his electric shock experiment, and Phil Zambardo, Zambardo demonstrated it in the Stanford prison experiment. Where judges have similar absolute power with no transparency or accountability, there's no wonder we see abuse of power in family court as well. Phil Zambardo says that the modern day hero who's trying to reform the system is the antidote for evil and absolute power. I want to share that there's a lot of really good people in the legal system who fight for reform and social change and really want to help others. For example, Richard Fine experienced 18 months of solitary confinement when judges retaliated against him for exposing other judges who received illegal bribes. Leon Koziel wrote a book, scheduled marches, and conducted rallies to protest family court corruption that caused him to lose his law license when judges retaliated against him for speaking out. Susan Settenbrino had to give up her law practice to protect her clients from judicial retaliation against her because she blew the whistle and spoke out against court corruption. And she wrote a book which I read and inspired my uh, video about court corruption. In other videos on my channel, I propose five measures for reform which are specifically tailored to reforming the problem of the lack of transparency and accountability problem in the courts. Click the link in the upper right hand corner of your screen or in the description portion of this video for more information about these five court reform measures. The whole point of this video is that we have a corrupt system, not so much bad individuals, and money has too much of an influence in politics. So we need to promote court reform measures of transparency and accountability and get involved in local government as committee people where we can be more powerful in our fight for court reform measures. I hope you like this video about the influence of money in politics on the court. 
and the problems with absolute judicial power without transparency or accountability. We, as ordinary people, can make a difference if we fight for reform. So please, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell, click the like button, and leave a comment below. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.